This is Missy Dalloway, Director of Development for the Epilepsy Foundation Eastern Pennsylvania and the host of Epilepsy End. Last episode, we talked to Luke DeBevick, a lawyer who was diagnosed with epilepsy in the middle of his career. We also talked to Dr. Kate Davis, Medical Director of the Epilepsy Monitoring Unit and the Epilepsy Surgery Program at the University of Pennsylvania about new treatment and technology being developed by the team at Penn Medicine. The second episode of Epilepsy End is the part two continuation of our conversation around epilepsy and research. If you haven't listened to the first episode, we encourage you to go back and listen. Now, on to the show. Did you know that over 110,000 people in eastern Pennsylvania live with epilepsy? The Walk Den Epilepsy Pennsylvania series exists to bring together our local epilepsy community to raise funds and share a commitment to finding a cure. Learn more about our local walks by visiting epilepsywalkpa.org. Want to find a walk in another state? Visit walkdenepilepsy.org to join the movement to end epilepsy in your community. So why do you think that people living with epilepsy should be interested and invested in the field of research? Because we're the beneficiaries. Um, It doesn't get much more direct than that. Our families all get to see that as well. The impact of epilepsy isn't only on us, it's on the people around us. And it's valuable to be able to to find solutions to, to make life a little more easy. Epilepsy And is a podcast sharing stories of hope from the patient community and the latest in medical advances. One in 26 people will develop epilepsy, but it's more than seizures. Join the Epilepsy Foundation Eastern Pennsylvania and become part of the conversation. Luke DeBevick is not just a lawyer for Reed Smith. He is also an advocate for epilepsy. So why is it important to invest in research? The better the process gets, you know, the, the more side effects that get eliminated, you know, the, the better for each individual who's, who's struggling with the condition. It's a nightmare for me to have to think about my kids dealing with me having epilepsy, whether it's witnessing it, worrying about it. I don't even want them to have to think about it but it's, it's there. It's, it's hanging out in the background of everything. Especially in neuroscience, and this is not just in epilepsy, research is being directly translated to patient care on a weekly, if not daily basis. There are things that are done in research that have enabled us to change our treatments and therapies for patients at a very, very rapid pace. Unfortunately, with an increasingly long list of seizure medications that are available, we haven't really been able to touch that one-third of patients with medications alone to make them seizure-free. And we need better guidance to know how to treat these patients as quickly, as effectively as possible, not to expose them to treatments that would not ultimately help them. The only way that we can do this is with research. Funding is important to any research. Unfortunately, epilepsy research is not getting the funding it needs. How we support research and how to keep pushing this forward is a major topic of discussion. Unfortunately, in most epilepsy specialists' opinion, the National Institute of Health underfunds epilepsy research in comparison to the other brain disorders. So a lot of research is now being pushed forward through things like the Epilepsy Foundation and I would say I personally reviewed major grant mechanisms for junior investigators through the Epilepsy Foundation, and the applications are astounding. But there were almost 30 of them, and two people will be awarded research money. I think it's an unmet need. I've been very fortunate to have some grateful patients give to my research. That has made a tremendous impact on my ability to push forward my lab's research. But we need more federal funding. We need more funding from societies. We need patient investment to help those things move along, both at a national level with your Congress people and then on a more local level, like with the Epilepsy Foundation of Eastern Pennsylvania. So how does research translate into help for people with epilepsy? Well, Dr. Davis talked a little bit about 
the epilepsy monitoring unit and about the work they do there. And so I had had some experience with that. And that was a big part of the work of determining whether I was a candidate for the surgery. And anyone who's thinking about this as an option, it's it's an interesting experience to say the least. And, and Dr. Davis was probably right to say that it's about as invasive of a technique as you can find. But it's it's worth it for seizure freedom if if you get that. Many of our patients do not have effective treatments yet. Our medications work for a majority of patients, but there's a significant minority, about a third, that don't respond to medication therapy. And so not only is there a need for additional research for new medicines that potentially non-invasively without a surgical procedure could help a patient, but there's tremendous need for an improvement in our surgical approaches for our patients. Right now, we use various different modalities of imaging and scalp EEG and video to look at seizure semiology, which is what a patient does during a seizure, in addition to their neuropsychological testing to help us decide what surgical intervention to do. We're just starting to incorporate more quantitative measures of all of these different modalities into our treatment decision process. This time period is just so exciting in terms of what we can do now with computers, bioengineering, to pull out some of these types of features automatically that can then aid us in our patient care and help guide us towards the best treatment and therapy for a given patient. Unfortunately, right now, when I have a patient like Luke, I can use all of the different data points that we collect and we have information on how predictive of a good surgical outcome, for instance, each one would be. But then it's really still an art of medicine to pull this all together and figure out what the best therapy for a patient is. I think with the type of machine learning algorithms that are really being applied right now and quantitative approaches, we can make that much more exact and predictive. Recently, Dr. Davis received the Dreyfus Penry Epilepsy Award for her work with non-invasive imaging. She explains her work, the difference it makes, and why it matters. My lab has, in the last five years ago, embarked on several different key directions. One is using 7T MRI, which is higher resolution, so more high-def pictures, sort of if you're thinking about looking at a television screen, going from more a fuzzy image to a clear image of the brain. That until recently was a research-only study, but the FDA fortunately just approved 7 MRI for clinical use. I've been running the 7 MRI program for about six years now at Penn, and there was a technique that was developed at Penn by Dr. Ravinder Reddy's lab that enables us to measure glutamate, which is the most common excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, non-invasively using 7T MRI. So that has been one thrust of the lab. Our initial work has shown that we've been able to see hidden lesions that were not evident on standard MRI by looking at the level of glutamate activity in certain areas of the brain. So still working on this. It's very new, but I think it holds promise. Also on 7T MRI, we've been looking at resting state connectivity, which allows us to look at how much metabolism or blood flow needs to go to an area of a brain during different states, again, to try to localize epilepsy networks non-invasively. I also run a 3T MRI research program. The 3T MRI is what most of the epilepsy patients have now as part of a standard pre-surgical evaluation. But we've been adding some novel different sequences or different imaging acquisition methods to that 3T protocol, and we're starting to be able to kind of connect dots using quantitative measures. So for instance, one piece of work that we've just recently completed and is under review is looking at structural networks, so the different fibers that connect different areas of the brain, and then connecting that to our intracranial EEG findings and looking how seizures on intracranial EEG, when you're measuring inside on the surface of the brain or deep in the brain, how they follow the white matter tracks or these fibers connecting different areas. I think this kind of work has tremendous potential for impact in that we can now start layering on different non-invasive measures to predict where seizures are coming from before we put intracranial electrodes in or guide us in where to put the intracranial electrodes so that we're doing the least invasive procedure as possible for a patient. Multi-center collaboration is when different researchers from various institutions from around the country or even the world work together by sharing information and make progress towards a bigger goal. Dr. Davis explains why this is necessary in the field of epilepsy. No doubt that's what we need. We can't answer 
any of these questions in a way that will be fully translatable to to the clinic, to the patient, without testing our research questions at multiple centers. So I have been involved in several multi-center trials. Most of them been actually focused around cognitive research, but it can be done. And unfortunately, we have not to date been able to find funding sources interested in funding these much larger types of expensive research studies. That said, the Epilepsy Foundation recently had a, a large grant mechanism called My Seizure Gauge, which the winners of that award will focus on a multi-center study trying to pull together a lot of different types of data, including intracranial data, and in an attempt to try to create devices that can predict when seizures will occur for an individual patient. I look forward to seeing the results of those studies and also seeing similar, honestly expensive studies because they're from multiple centers and you want to get high quality data and multiple different types of data. I really want to see those kind of studies get funded and uh, they're just starting to and really Epilepsy Foundation has been the leader on that. After the break, Luke talks about how he is helping professionals working with disabilities and Dr. Davis tells us why she chose the field of epilepsy. This episode is brought to you by Penn Medicine. Penn Medicine is a world-renowned academic medical center that ranks number one in Philadelphia and top 10 in the U.S. The Penn Epilepsy Center is recognized by the National Association of Epilepsy Centers as a level four epilepsy center. What does level four mean? Level four epilepsy centers have the professional expertise and facilities to provide the highest level medical and surgical evaluation and treatment for patients with complex epilepsies. Visit penmedicine.org backslash epilepsy for more information. That's penmedicine.org backslash epilepsy. About one in three individuals taking anti-seizure medications still have seizures and others get unwanted side effects. Individuals with epilepsy are in a special position to help others through participating in medical research that can lead to innovative and effective treatment options. Participating in a clinical trial is a significant commitment and one should always have good understanding about the study and clinical trials in general before any agreement is made. To learn more about epilepsy research and how to join a clinical trial, visit efepa.org backslash research. Visit efepa.org backslash research. Just as important as treatment, support from family, work, and the community is a huge factor in helping people with epilepsy. Family first, which I get through my wife, and then everybody at work. All of that is important. Um, I'm not sure I'd be able to to do everything as as easily as I do without my wife. It it makes it easier to, to handle things that are new and different and hard. But work would have been almost impossible without support from people who understand or who are willing to listen and learn. So people talking about all of the different types of of accommodating disability, and mine in particular, and helping me find ways to continue doing my job well. And that's both myself, but also all the people around who are helping make that happen. Not everyone receives the support they need, especially in the workplace. With the help of his law firm, Luke DeBevic is figuring out ways to help others. I work with a group that I helped start at my law firm called Leaders. And it's something that I really jumped into once I think the seizures started. Because it was something to, to do in my work life productively with what was going on. And something I could put time into when I didn't feel like I was able to do lawyer work more specifically. It was something that was important to me and it was something that I'd liked to do. And so I did it. And I found a ton of support with my employer, my law firm, Reed Smith. I found other people at my firm who also had different types of disability. And suddenly we were all talking with each other and knowing other people and supporting them. And the group's just grown every year since then. That was about five years ago. And now we might have 80 people. Initially, it was three. And beyond that, it's spreading across our offices. Our clients are very interested in setting up similar types of initiatives. 
and we're kind of spreading the word around to other people in the profession, the legal profession, that there's room for inclusion and the discussion around ability being an important discussion to have. And uh, there's a ton of unconscious bias, not just in the legal profession, but in the, the world at large and kind of tackling that and getting people to recognize value and the humanity of people, I think it's really important. Luke knows that we can do better, but it starts with having a conversation. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's, it's important because it, it's a discussion that feeds off of itself. And if it's, not, if it's not a discussion that's had, then it's easily ignored. But when, when people in the legal profession or any profession start talking about an issue and their clients start saying it's important to them, then their competitors start saying, oh, wait a second, there's value in this for me. And then those people start doing things. And then suddenly there's a competition to do better instead of just no discussion and, and things just improve quickly. And I've seen that happen in only a few years. Suddenly there's a lot of more people talking in the law about different types of disability and the underemployment of people with disability who have law degrees and creating a pipeline through law school and, in, and into the height of the profession. I think there's a ton of work to be done. One of the things that I was honestly shocked to learn and so proud of was that Luke brought this idea of his of bringing together lawyers with disabilities and took it all the way to actually holding a conference that was well attended. We've actually done it twice now in the past two years. We started in Philadelphia nine days before the, the surgery. We had a, about 300 clients from around the country and the world here in Philadelphia, over on the river, talking specifically about disability first and foremost. We had three different panels of, of different attorneys and leaders of different businesses talking about the importance of it to them and how they can improve. And beyond that, we talked about diversity more generally, all types, and people spoke on all of those topics as well. This was a, something that we wanted, my group wanted to have happen from the moment we started talking with each other. We wanted to have a conference where we could just kind of start the momentum forward and get other people excited about it. We talked about it with the people in my firm and they were, they loved it and they thought it was a great idea. They just wanted to make it bigger, which we were all for. And so that's exactly what we did. And it went off so well, we did it again this year uh, in, in DC and uh, next year to be announced. Wow, that's wonderful. That is really cool. I yeah. remember how you just like snuck that in when I was yeah. talking to you one day. Oh, and I'm doing this other side thing. <laughs> I said I was, Nine days before I was shocked. <laughs> so. It was something that I was able to focus a lot of my own attention on the six months heading into the surgery. I was able to both find something constructive and important to do, but also distract myself. <laughs> Sending out tons of invitations, beating all the ground for people to show up and making sure that people knew it was happening and that it would be a good event. There are all types of people helping to make a change in our community. But for Dr. Davis, the field of epilepsy is where she knows she can make the biggest difference. Undergraduate, I was really drawn to neuroscience and understanding the brain Fortunately, when I went to medical school, I worked with Dr. Hal Blumenfeld, who is an epileptologist at Yale, and I had the opportunity to work with him in his lab. I actually did work on consciousness and epilepsy, looking at a certain type of imaging called a SPEC scan. Fast forward to today, I still use imaging in my research, so he clearly had tremendous impact on my decision making. Again, when I came to Penn for residency and then fellowship, I found working with epilepsy patients to be the best fit for me, being able to work with patients from any age group, with many of our patients having onset of epilepsy in early childhood, but also in later adult years. And I enjoy working with all of those different types of patients, and it keeps things very, very interesting. Epilepsy as a disease is extremely interesting from the research perspective. Not only can we develop new treatments and therapies for epilepsy, but we can also understand how underlying brain networks function with the type of tests we do during normal clinical care for our epilepsy patients. So it really allows me to not only enjoy my clinical work, but be very inspired on the research side and contribute to our knowledge about how the brain works. Research is an ongoing process, and it will take a lot of smart and dedicated people to eventually cure epilepsy. Dr. Davis believes it is important that we start recruiting the next generation of epileptologists now. How do we entice the next generation of epileptologists? I think 
One, it's my job and my colleague's job to do that. We are doing that at Penn with early exposure to epilepsy treatment and also making them excited about it. And once residents that have decided to go into neurology see all of the different things that we do as epileptologists, they are usually very enticed. I mean, as I as I mentioned before, the epilepsy gives us a kind of gateway into to studying underlying normal and abnormal brain function. So there's a tremendous amount of fascinating research that can be done in this field. And the I would say the field is still at its nascency. There's still so much more to learn from our epilepsy patients that consent to do some of those research studies. I also really love reading EEGs and um, <laughs> and uh, that's uh, that's obviously for some people, not for some people, but it's fascinating to me to read EEGs and understand the underlying brain rhythms that are causing patients to have different symptoms. We see that even in a more granular way when we read intracranial EEG and being able to map out function when we have someone with intracranial EEG is also fascinating. The kind of multi-level way that we look at each patient from so many different angles, from their imaging, from their EEG, from their seizure semiology, from their other symptoms like cognitive symptoms, and from their interpersonal relationships. It's very complex and it's very interesting. It can be very rewarding. It can be really tough. But I think that anyone who goes into epilepsy ends up really enjoying it and loving it. It's also important that young epileptologists are given the money they need to pursue their research. Another perspective, I think, to get the the best talent to stay in epilepsy, really investment in the grant mechanisms to support young investigators is really the way to go. So being able to give that young investigator their first grant, and these grants aren't a tremendous amount of money, but it gives them a jump start. It gets them that preliminary data to go and get a larger grant from perhaps the National Institute of Health or the NIH. That has a tremendous longstanding impact, and I personally was a grant recipient from the Epilepsy Foundation, American Epilepsy Society, and I know that that made a tremendous difference in in my career trajectory, and I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now doing what I do now if it weren't for that opportunity. Creating better treatments for epilepsy is bigger than just the researchers and those affected. One of the challenges of getting even younger trainees into epilepsy is that, unfortunately, epilepsy still is not talked about enough. It's under-recognized. People don't recognize how common seizures in epilepsy is. And that has been a huge message from the Epilepsy Foundation. One in 26 people have, have seizures That's a tremendous number of people. And I would challenge anyone if they really asked everyone they knew that they would know many, many people that had epilepsy or seizures. But it's not talked about yet um, enough. That diminishes the external impact that people may think an epilepsy specialist will have. Once you get into the field, you know how common it is though. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of social stigma surrounding epilepsy. It's getting better with time, but it is by no means where it should be and comparing it to maybe the comfort that someone would have talking about another neurologic disease like like multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease or stroke. There's a discomfort talking still about epilepsy. Even with all of the challenges and social stigma, Luke believes that young professionals with disabilities should not be afraid to enter the workforce. Uh, Do it. You should enter the workforce. You can do it. There's, there's opportunity out there, and the focus that you need to place within yourself is on what you can do and trying to help yourself find ways to overcome the things that you see as obstacles. A lot of epilepsy is, is I think it's different for everybody. And so my, what I say isn't true for everybody. But in my experience, it can be done, um, but it's not easy. You've done such a nice job, Luke, of highlighting. I loved some of the ways you described what epilepsy is to you. It's not just the seizures. Mm -hmm. It's that background that's always going on, which is cognitive, which is for many patients mood and um, side effects from medications. Getting to know Luke has been such a privilege for me, and I've learned a lot from him. And why do I love treating epilepsy patients? I love the wide variety of patients that I get to see, from patients like Luke, who is a lawyer, to patients who have severe cognitive deficits, and I'm helping their care team care for that individual and make everyone's quality of life as as good as it possibly can be. 
Keep an eye out for our next episode of Epilepsy End, which will be released on a monthly basis. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcast. You can also visit efepa.org for more resources or to find our podcast. This is your host, Missy Dalloway. Until next time. Are you a young adult living with epilepsy? The EFEPA offers a free wellness weekend for individuals ages 18 to 30. The retreat focuses on addressing the unique needs of young adults with epilepsy through socialization, skill building, introduction to wellness techniques, all designed to help you be empowered in epilepsy. To learn more, contact us at camp at EFEPA.org. Epilepsy and is produced by the Epilepsy Foundation, Eastern Pennsylvania.